Blog Talk Radio. Hey, what's cracking? This is Darren Fatman McDuffie welcoming you to Fat Man Radio. So tonight's episode, uh, I'm going to have a colleague of mine, and actually uh, you probably won't know this, but uh, Dana, who is the author of the book Exercise Safety, uh, we went to a, a fitness training together. So she's the guest tonight, and we're going to be talking about exercise safety. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is just make a couple of announcements. The first one is um, I'm on another podcast. Um, in addition to Blog Talk Radio, I have a podcast that's on iTunes, which I do with a lady by the name of Diane uh, Kayser. Diane is a functional diagnostic nutritionist, and uh, we do a, a wellness podcast called Wellness Warrior Radio. So look for that on iTunes. This podcast as well, this Blog Talk uh, podcast is waiting to be approved by iTunes. So if you miss something in the podcast tonight or on the show tonight, look for it. I'm expecting uh, iTunes to uh, be able to uh, certify that or um, give me permission to put that into iTunes within the next day or so. So look for that. Next thing is uh, Facebook fan page. I'm in the process of building my Facebook fan page, and I really need your help. Uh, my Facebook fan page is I'm the Fat Man, so that's I like initial, M like Mary, fat, which you know how to spell, P-H-A-T, and man. So if you have not joined my Facebook fan page, do go in there and join the fan page. I'm looking to build that fan page and give you lots of good information. Last thing is... I have a blog post that I've been working on for a while on uh, my I'm the fat man dot com blog, and on that blog post, I'll be talking about eggs now eggs are something simple, but I know when I started my nutrition journey, I was so confused about eggs and what kind of eggs to purchase from the grocery store, so I'm going to kind of break that down for you. Um, I'm tentatively scheduled to put that on a blog tomorrow, but it may be Thursday, so look for that and what I would also encourage you to do is to make a comment. I know a lot of times it's it's easy to be passive, but uh, when you do make a comment and read something, you put yourself out there and you may answer a question or you may start some type of dialogue and somebody out there may be wanting to know uh, just what you're thinking or you may just, again, spark some kind of dialogue around some of the things that are going on on the blog. So I would encourage you to participate, get active, and get involved. That was one of the things that I did when I started my nutritional journey. A lot of us want someone to just feed us information. And the thing is, if you're going to go beyond what you are getting out there in the media, you're going to have to do the research, you're going to have to read and, and do some of the stuff yourself. And that was one of the things that I did on my journey. I've been studying nutrition for eight years, and it wasn't something that just, uh, it wasn't something that I did in a day. And I think we'll discuss that tonight with exercise progression, but it just wasn't something I did in a day. It's a process, and it takes time for you to get to a certain level. And I'm still learning. Much of the stuff I know, I know maybe a lot more than you in the audience that are listening, but there's stuff that I'm still learning. So it's always a constant journey, and it's about change, and it's about growing. So, all right. So that's it. I'm just, I'm off my soapbox, and I'm ready to start the show. So I'm going to see if I can bring Dana Gore on to uh, talk about, about her book. Dana, I'm hoping that you. Is, is that you? Dana, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you just just great, just great. Okay. So um, was I on my soapbox too much tonight? Were you listening? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. One of the things I like to do is just get the audience familiar with who you are. And I know from reading, uh, you know, just a part of the book that you had – some things that kind of guided you into the uh, the fitness industry, and can you can you kind of give people your synopsis your synopsis and how you got into uh, mm. this whole thing and how you began to write your book? Yes, well, I actually have a background in the cosmetology industry, and I spent a good portion of my adult life doing that, uh, being a hairdresser. It's not an easy thing to do for the body. You know, your back starts hurting after a while. It's a lot of physical work. And I would go home at the end of the day often just with no energy. 
And before that, in high school, I had ha- also had multiple eating disorders. You know, when you're in school and your self-worth is not is not at a wonderful place and you're comparing yourself and always coming up the loser to everybody else, you know, you kind of take that stuff out on yourself. And that was something that I did. So I would have to say my relationship with fitness and nutrition was more reactive than anything. It was more of a reaction and an uneducated reaction on top of it based on a lot of emotional turmoil. And I think that that's what a lot of other people go through as well. We'll get to that at some point. And after many years in the cosmetology industry, and I wasn't thrilled doing it, it was sort of a means to an end, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and I ended up stumbling upon this job at a small fitness center. It was um, it was one of those, like, circuits, you know, the super circuit systems, kind of like curves, but they used real weights rather than the hydraulics that they used at curves, and they... One ahead, I was like 40 pounds overweight. At one point, I had actually been over 210 pounds, and I lost it and put like half of it back on. <laughs> and um, so they ended up, and I was a smoker too. So they hired me because I was I was convenient. I was like down the street, and I was willing to work the hours. And it was a huge risk for me because I was cutting out my afternoon hair clients. So I was taking a huge financial risk, but I was so unhappy doing what I was doing in this job kind of came along, and I did not actually need to have any qualifications. All I needed to do was know how to run that circuit system. Anything outside of the circuit system, I was not allowed to do because that I was not qualified enough to teach other people. So as I'm running this, as I'm running this little circuit system about three hours a day, five days a week, uh, I had come across, started looking at different schools different ways to get certified. You know, my boss at the time had told me, you really need to be careful you're not certified of who you can start showing other instructions to. So I started looking around, especially after a terrible day at the salon, and I was like, I think I've had it. I'm just done. I'm done. And I swear the next day I found Fitness Institute, and I called (laughs) up, and they had already started their curriculum. And so... If you've gone to the school, so I know you know Jane. And once yeah, you get to a yeah. conversation, with, once you get to a conversation with Jane Roycroft, then that's it. And she so and I had put this in the book. She's so effervescent. She really pulls you in. She was like, it doesn't matter if we had already started a week ago. It's not too late for you to catch up. Come in, sit in the class, no obligation. See what you think. So I go and I tell my husband, look, I'm going to go. It's at NBC Suites. So I'm going to be at a hotel from like 7 to 10 tonight. And all he heard was, wife going to hotel. <laughs> I think I'll go with her. <laughs> and that was it. We were sitting in, and it happened to have been the class on myths and quackery. And we're sitting there, and we're listening. I remember that one. Oh, it was a fantastic class, and he's going over all these gadgets and gizmos and this and that and the other and I oh, this isn't too intimidating okay you know and we're sitting there and after the class and it was fascinating you know even just right down to how sweating doesn't mean uh calorie burn and it, in fact it, it actually inhibits calorie burn because your body is so busy cooling itself off that it's not moving the blood through the body rather than shunting it to the surface of the skin to cool it off So it was like, oh, I used to buy those little belts and stuff to help me sweat more. And little did I know, I was actually not doing myself any favors. I was was holding on to extra calories and further enhancing dehydration. So all I had to do was sit in that class, and I was like, I think this is something I would like to do. And then, of course, the following class was anatomy, and I was like, what the heck did I get myself into? But (laughs) that was it. We did it. And we went through all six classes, and you know, sitting through everything. And as I'm sitting through these classes and Dr. Rabbit's talking about all of these things in the fitness industry, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) Oh, wow, I had no idea. And these were some simple things that if if you just had some type of awareness, of what it is to look for in your in your exercise program in the fitness industry in general, it could actually mean the difference between injury and not injury and life or death. So anyway, 
I ended up writing. I finished the school and found my passion for writing, which I had always had. Started with a bunch of articles, got published in Happy Herald. I had my own fitness column in there every month, and uh, then I ended up writing a book. So. Cool. And, I, I mean, I'm certainly a victim of all of that stuff. I remember um, when I was – before I, I went to Fitness Institute International, I fell for everything. I remember I used to wear those uh, those – vest or whatever like a jacket that make you sweat and i would even put the stuff on my body called abilene which makes you sweat more and yeah. uh, i thought that i was just you know losing weight and and thought that i was so healthy and it wasn't until i actually went to dr abbott's classes and got a little bit more educated about fitness and exercise foundations and all the stuff that we learned um that i began to kind of break free from mm-hmm. that so I, I, I yeah. definitely relate, and I can still hear Dr. Abbott talking right now as we speak. But um, he, he getting is in, talking right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he's holding the class right now. Um, but yeah. we let's let's get into the book, and the book is Exercise Safety. Um, there was a quote that I pulled out, and I remember this so vividly um, when I was sitting in uh, Exercise Foundations that I had to pull it out and just get you to expand on it. And I think what it will do is just give people the magnitude to what uh, exercise actually does uh, to the body. So one of the quotes I pulled out, and I believe this is from uh, Dr. Abbott, Dr. Anthony Abbott, it says, when people exercise, there's a radically increased chance of having a cardiovascular incident because of the increased stress that comes with exercise. Can you expand on that and just let people know how serious exercise is? Yes. Well, you, you you follow these little fitness programs and you think all is fine and dandy, but you don't actually realize that when you exercise, you're physically stressing out your body. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but when you're taking people into consideration that might have, I don't know, heart conditions or, or other medical conditions, there's still a level of stress that you're putting on the body. So you have to be very, very mindful of what type of intensity you're going to put your client through or yourself through because you don't know. And really that includes anything, and uh, proper progression is is a big component of that one as well. Right, right, yeah, I I definitely agree with that. So one of the things I I, I gather from your book is um, that you don't think exercise safety is a concern for most people. Why, Why don't you think that? I don't think that people think about it. I don't think that, yeah, I don't think people think about it. I think that there's such, I think that there's such an abundance of information slash misinformation out there grabbing people's attention that, A, I just don't think that a lot of people are aware of it. And when I had done the keyword research, when I was looking for the title and everything, Mm -hmm. exercise safety and fitness safety hardly pulled up any searches. But if you looked up, say, like six-pack abs or weight loss diets or whatever, or fast weight loss diets, I mean, you're looking in the millions. But nobody was looking up exercise safety. It was a huge concern of mine. I'm like, I need to title this book so that people will pay attention to it. It will come up in the search engines, but there was nothing else I could possibly call it. I was like, never mind. I'm going to call it what it's supposed to be called, and hopefully people will get it. So... Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, people don't pay enough attention to the safety aspect until, you know, something happens, until they get injured, until, um, you know, somebody uh, uh, has an accident or something like that, or even if somebody dies. I hate to be negative, but uh, I remember sitting in Dr. Abbott's classes and just having him, um, I think it was at a graduation I went to, and he had people come up on stage, and there were several people who had had cardiac incidences while they were exercising and they were lucky enough to have their lives saved by people that he had trained. So we'll get into that a little bit uh, a little bit later. So the next question is, and this is something that when I sat in, in his classes, it really resonated with me. And it was one of the reasons why I, I scraped and, and scrounged and did whatever I had to do because I really wasn't in the best. I was somewhat similar to you. I really wasn't in the best financial situation, but I made it a priority to get into his classes. And it's that thing of being certified versus qualified. Can you talk about that? What's the difference in a certified personal trainer and a real qualified personal trainer? Yes. A certified personal trainer 
can take a quick exam online and pay like 50 bucks, and they won't even pay until they pass the exam, which they can take over and over and over again. And it'll cover basic questions, maybe some basic muscle questions, and they can print out a certification saying that they have a certification, basically. And they can advertise themselves as being certified and start training people. Whereas like a qualified trainer, and there are some schools or even some weekend courses that people might take, and that on top of it, you know, they'll get you certified. But I'm not, I haven't actually sat in on one of them, but I can't say that in comparison to the 360 hours that we went through, that it's going to be anything even close to qualified. There's a lot to take into consideration. So, you know, the amount of time that a person spends in their education and and actually being involved in everything really sort of means a lot. And I'm not knocking anybody. I I really just I want to put this out there, whether it comes to the in-home programs or the certification program. My job isn't to throw anyone or anything under the bus. I'm not here to, you know, to, um, to put anything or anyone down but really just to sort of demonstrate the differences between between the two. So. Yeah, and I, I know for me, I wanted to be able to speak that language because I know uh, if I spoke with a doctor or spoke with someone else who was a healthcare professional, I wanted to be able to speak their language, and I know that I would not be able to do that if I would have did a weekend certification. And plus, I'm a big person on doing things right, and I know that, when I went to school, when I sat in the classes, I know that that was the right place for me because it resonated for me. No matter, you know, the sacrifices that I had to make, you know, going, I had to leave work, go to, I'm um, actually working in Boca at the time, and uh, I would leave work, um, well, not leave work, I would stay work until 7 o'clock and then just hustle on over to Embassy Suites and stay there for 7 to 10. And I remember some nights I would come home like, man, is this really worth it? <laughs> you get home at 10, you don't really have anything. Uh, you can only, the only thing you have time to do is eat and then really go to bed and get ready for, you know, for your next next day. So um, I'm glad that I went through the classes and I became qualified. Now, let's talk about some of the things that make a personal trainer qualified or some of the things that, some people out there don't know that a personal trainer should be doing. Um, tell us some things that you think a personal trainer should be doing, and if they aren't doing these things, I would say fire a personal trainer and get you and get you another one. The medical history, always do. I always do a medical history, and if I have any questions, like if they're checking off like a few boxes and writing down that they take a bunch of different uh, medications. I pretty much insist on talking to their doctor and getting an okay, and I've done that a couple times. You know, even just getting some basic instructions. You know, yeah, it's okay that they train, but just, you know, keep the spinal flexion at this and that and the other. So, you know, those are some things. I always take everybody's blood pressure, and I get lists of their medications. I, I think you noticed that in the book I had mentioned something about beta blockers, and somebody's on a beta blocker, and they can't exercise necessarily at the same intensity as somebody right. else because there's already a constraint on the amount of work that the heart's going to do. So you're, right. you're can, overstressing it. Can you explain um, beta blockers and what those are? <clears throat> beta blockers help to control your heart. They help to kind of slow it down. It's for high blood pressure. So what that does is it lessens, it, it lowers the blood pressure. So. Okay. And let me take a quick little break here. If anybody wants to ask a question and wants to be on the air and ask Dan a question, the number is 646-716-9371. Again, the number is 646-716-9371. If you, you know, get on the uh you hit a prompt, just hit one, and I'll bring you on the air to ask a question. So, all right. So you said blood pressure. That's a good one. Yeah. Medical history. Yes. Why, Definitely why is proper it a, progression. Also. Say that you again. Can't I'm sorry. Just take, you can't just take the progression. You can't just take a client and throw them into some kind of an exercise program without knowing what they can do. Especially if they're deconditioned or, or overweight you have to do some type of an assessment and see what they can do, see what their body is capable of doing before just drawing up some sort of cookie-cutter program and, 
and pushing them through it. And you don't want anybody who's not going to pay attention to you or talk on the phone or or text or you want to make sure that they're making sure that you're not chewing gum and that and that you're present. Right. Those that's are just true, a couple true. things. Yeah, you are. They, I remember um, one of my personal experiences. This is when I used to live in Atlanta. I went to Crunch. It's Crunch Fitness at the time. I don't know what it is now, but it was Crunch Fitness at the time. And I, I mean, and I considered myself to be someone who was always reasonably athletic. <laughs> and um, there was only a brief period in my life where I got really overweight. But I remember the personal trainer. He made me. I'm, I'm going in there as my introductory workout. And I'm sitting in there, um, you know, squatting, and I hadn't worked out in a long time. He has me squatting, you know, 225 pounds, which is, you know, two plates and two plates on the other end. And I remember he's making me go through, like, <clears throat> do 12, 13 reps of the exercise, and the next day I couldn't walk. And I'm like, what kind of personal – and this is before I knew anything about personal training, but – um my instinct told me that this something wasn't right about that, and I think that that's very profound. You know what you say about uh, exercise progression and the, the ability to be able to take someone from a beginner's level and kind of bring them up to those intermediate and advanced and those advanced steps. So we're talking about exercise progression, and let's just get into that a little bit, a little bit more. Why is that so important? I think you kind of hit on that a little bit, but can you just kind of reiterate that for for a second? Exercise progression is gradually increasing your level of difficulty as you become more accustomed to what you're doing. So, for example, if you're deconditioned, you would not start off maybe doing a full squat. If you don't know how to do a squat, let's just say you don't have you don't have the right form, you don't have enough lower body strength to do a squat, you would start off with a more modified version first. Maybe you would do a half a squat. Maybe you would use the stability ball against the wall, which is one of my favorite methods as well. And you would ease your way into doing into doing the full version, a progressed version of it. And it's it's basically, you know, when you watch some of these DVDs and you see someone doing, like, the modified version of the exercise and somebody might be doing an even more advanced version of the exercise, you would mm-hmm. do the modified version of the exercise. Right, but the thing right. Is, the thing is, and I threw this in a chapter where I started the chapter which discussed how our emotions dictate our decisions. And this, to me, is more important than anything. Because when you are in a place where you hate yourself and people say mean things to you and you don't look like that girl who's eaten the cheeseburgers and fits into a swimsuit model magazine and and you're down on yourself and you're watching these people on The Biggest Loser lose like 30 pounds a week and if they don't lose 30 pounds a week, they're going to be sent home like they failed their team. <laughs> yeah. You, your emotions dictate your decision. And if you haven't worked out ever, or if you haven't worked out since you've been in high school and here you're 40, you're going to throw yourself back into some kind of a program because you want that weight gone yesterday or if you have an event coming up. So people don't even think about trying to modify the exercises because their emotions, the desperation of this unhappiness that they're feeling is what's louder than anything else. And we always behave according to the loudest feeling we've got. And that's just the way it is. Yep, you're exactly right. And I always tell people this, um, people that I train, uh, is that you don't go out and run three miles the first day. Um, You go out, you might walk. Some people might crawl. (laughs) You might walk. Then you might start jogging, and then you may start, you know, running, and then you get eventually get to those uh, to those three miles. I hadn't been in the gym for maybe a year. I was doing more calisthenics, uh, and then I decided to get back in the gym this April and May. And I had no, there was no shame in my game. I went in there and I started deadlifting 135 pounds, and now my weight has gradually um, moved up, uh, and all of my weights have gradually moved up. But when I first started, I just took it. Very, very slowly to get my body my body acclimated to the weight, and we'll get into that as well, and uh, just begin to progress. And I think what happens with a lot of people is they 
aren't progressing fast enough because they don't really know what to do, and then they end up quitting. So yeah. exercise progression is, is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about fitness of a facility. If I'm going, like I went to a facility, I don't say where I work out, but when I went to my facility, I was just mainly looking for some specific things. If I'm a novice, I'm a beginner, and I'm going out there and I'm looking for a fitness facility, somewhere to go work out, what should I be looking for? Well, in my opinion, that's going to kind of depend on your on your current condition. I'll tell you right now, if you're post-rehabilitation, your best bet, in my opinion, would be to try to work with a specialist somewhere and look for a place, more maybe something that focuses a little bit more on physical therapy. Well, I would always go for the physical therapy first, but... Um, and then there are fitness facilities. They're like fitness studios that they screen the clients. So if you're like a special population, if there's like a pre-existing condition of any kind, I would probably go to one of those first. But let's just say you're a teenager and you're in pretty decent shape or whatever and you just want to go work out at some place. You could pretty much go to any place. I don't know that I would necessarily count on a level of, I don't know, high expertise from the staff. So as long as you're not going over there and, and trying to outdo everybody and and try to do too, more, too much more than you can stand, then I guess you can go to one of those places. But mm-hmm. usually the big chain gyms, they don't, I am just going to say, they don't necessarily require a major qualification from the trainers. So if they're not going to give you medical history, if they're not going to take your blood pressure, if they're just going to throw you into some kind of program, which they've done with me before, then I would probably steer clear of that. Mm-hmm. But if you're just going to go and you want to use the treadmill or you want to go use some of the machines, then, hey, that's fine. But, again, if you're if it's special populations, if you've got a replaced knee and this, that, and the other, then you might want to work with someone who can pay a little more attention to you and maybe go to a gym where they have high-qualified trainers, maybe NSCA qualified, ACSM qualified, uh, any bachelor's in uh, exercise science or above, you know, with a university degree. NASM is another good one. The ACSM and the NSCA are the two only nonprofit ones that I know of, though. Right, right. I was going to ask you that a little bit later on, but you touched on that as well. Um, So... You mentioned uh, special populations, and I know in your book I read where, you know, you had general population and special population. Can you kind of tell people a little bit about that? General population is is kind of a no-brainer, but special population, what would qualify a person as a special population? You mentioned uh, just now that maybe they had a rehabilitated knee or something was wrong with their knee, a knee replacement. So what other things are considered special populations. Yeah, special populations. Anybody with previous conditions or illnesses or any anything that has to do maybe with a stroke, heart attack, um, any pre-existing cancers that they might have recovered from, any type of prior surgeries that they might have had, whether it's a knee replacement, hip replacement, shoulder replacement, um, diabetes, um, end-stage renal disease, a lot of these, a lot of these diseases that people have. I'm just kind of going off of the top of my head. Um, that's okay. That type of thing. Even obesity, um, elderly fall into a special population. Kids could fall into a special population. Pregnant women, all of these people fall into a special population. And the general population would be someone maybe a little overweight at, at best, <laughs> mm-hmm. but otherwise like. Nothing else is going on. They're they're generally healthy, and they don't have anything going on in the past that needs any, you know, special required attention. Even somebody who might have broken their wrist in the past, you want to find these things out because if you want them to, I don't know, do a full-arm plank or something, you want to know that their wrist can handle it. Yeah, and I believe the plank is one of your favorite exercises from your book, correct? 
Yeah, as long as their <laughs> shoulders and their elbows and their wrists can handle it. I love the plank, especially for people with a bad back. It's a great way right. to strengthen the core. Yeah, yeah. So we're in the fitness facility. We decide to join the fitness facility. Yeah. What should we, I know in my uh, particular facility they teach classes. What should, should I go up to a uh, a fitness instructor. So let's say somebody's teaching Zumba, somebody's teaching uh, Power Pump. I don't know what what they call these classes. Mm-hmm. I've never taken any, take any of them. But is it admissible for me to go up to that fitness instructor and say, hey, what are your qualifications? Would you advise someone to do that? Yeah, why not? I have no problem with that. And not only do I think that that is a good idea, but if mm-hmm. there are any pre-existing conditions, I would bring them. Up. I would bring them up. So let's just say you had your hip replaced, and you're thinking of going and taking the Zumba class. You can walk up to the Zumba instructor. I would suggest get there a few minutes early, introduce yourself. Hey, I'd like to take your class. Um, I have a hip replacement. I'd like to know is this a good class for me, and can somebody like me work? in this class is there like a beginner's level that I can follow along with and definitely find out what their qualifications are because if it's just like oh I've been teaching it for five years but I don't know anything about the human anatomy then yeah I don't know that that might be the right class for you exactly I'm going to quote you because I love Dexter and you pulled out a great Dexter (laughs) Morgan quote and that it says there are no secrets in life just hidden truths that lie beneath the surface, and that's from Dexter Morgan from Dexter. I love that show. So, <laughs> so yeah, so um, I get what you're saying, that you should just kind of reveal things. I think a lot of times people will hold things back if they've had an injury, uh, especially something like a knee or a back or something like that, and you really need to let, you know, the trainer know or the instructor know because something can happen, and they, you know, they'd be totally unprepared for it. I know when I train people, um I always took the medical history, and I always wanted to know if they had joint problems, you know, just any type of problem so I could be aware of if I'm asking them to do something a little bit too strenuous and maybe we should take it easy and maybe I should modify something. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Always yep. communicate, always communicate. Here's another uh, uh, special population category. It would be COPD or asthma. Mm-hmm. COPD is emphysema mm-hmm. or bronchitis, and then there's asthma. And, you know, here we went through the classes and then the fitness testing. He had us do the lung function testing. And I will tell you, if you smoke, (laughs) which I used to do like a chimney, um, and you somehow, uh, you somehow like kind of ruin your lung function, you definitely want to be mindful with the type of intensity you're going to work out with. And it's not half bad to to have them do, say, like a lung function test if you've been a heavy smoker because that could definitely help, you know, monitor the intensity as well. Yeah, while we're talking about that, um, let's just talk about we're we're on fitness instructors and trainers. Let's just talk about the importance of having your, you know, your instructor or your trainer knowing CPR. How, How important is that? It's definitely important. It's something that you hope you don't ever have to use, but it's definitely important. So, I mean, to be honest, I don't train my clients. I'm not like your typical boot camp type of trainer. I put my clients through a lower intensity type of training. You've got a lot of boot camps out there that are really kicking it up like 10,000 notches, and anything could happen to anybody at any time. You definitely want to know how to try to bring them back. So Dr. Abbott did an entire eight, eight and a half hour day uh, when we were going through. I'm sure you went through it with Bob and Yoko. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. You know what? I almost think people expect that. I think people expect that, you know, to get beaten down by exercise. And that's why a lot of people end up disliking exercise. But what I found is that if you, you know, like we were talking about exercise progression, if you bring a client up slowly and you give them – you let them show that they can succeed, and then they'll progress a lot faster. But I think with the boot camp thing, it's it, it's people almost expect that for some reason or another, and mm-hmm. expect for things to be hard. And I don't think that that's all is necessarily true. I just I'm a very big advocate of really just stimulating the body enough, and then 
you know, bringing in the nutritional aspect of it. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but that's that's the way, you know, that's the way that I feel about it. Well, see, it's funny because just recently, and I was sitting, I was sitting in the foundations class uh, recently, just for a little bit. I go back and visit every now and then. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, Dr. Abbott's talking, and a thought went through my mind, which is like, when did human movement become so complicated? that safety needed to be a factor. And the reason is because, well, we've screwed it all up because fitness was not really supposed to be a fix. Fitness was supposed to be a natural extension of what human beings were meant to do. Exercise was something that we did when we, I don't know, when we went and, planted weeds or whatever for food and when we moved things around and when we didn't sit around all day and snarf down GMO-laden carbohydrates with absolutely no calorie burn. When exercise wasn't meant to be a remedy for a huge problem created by human beings, then we didn't have to think about all this high-intensity things. So the reason that all of these high-intensity programs are out there is because that's what's being marketed as a way to get those results because we are not going to stick with things unless we see the results right away because we're an instant gratification society. Exactly. So we don't believe in slow and steady wins the race. What we believe is I want what I want yesterday, and if I don't get it, then I'm going to find another way to do it. So everybody right. takes on too much too fast. Right. And while we're getting into that, let's just talk about, you know, these programs that are out there. I, I personally did insanity myself because I like a challenge, but I was at a state where I was in probably the best shape of my life before I went into that. I also did P90X, which I was in um, somewhat similar shape. Um, so for that person who's out there looking at an infomercial that comes on at 12 o'clock at night, they're struggling with their weight and they see an insanity, they see a P90X, they see a tap out, will you advise that type of person to go out and purchase one of these? They spend 100 bucks or whatever, they say three payments of 39 or whatever. Would you right. advise someone like that to spend that type of money to, to do that? I would advise someone, my opinion, I would advise someone to maybe make that a goal, but if they're totally deconditioned, I don't know that that would be the right program to start with. And don't get me wrong, I think that they're great programs. I've I've done P90X workouts, and I, I think that they're great. I've noticed a couple things with some of the form here and there on some of the exercises. I don't think it's cool to do an upright row with your elbows pointing up toward the ceiling. But I think that they're fine programs. But if you're deconditioned, unless you can really – really limit yourself and properly progress and actually do the modified version first instead of being in a huge hurry, then fine. But if you can't, then you really need to get a more modified version of these programs and progress your way into it. You know, speaking of P90X, I haven't actually seen it, but I think he's got a program out called P90. And I think that that's... Exactly, yes. Yeah, I think that's like a regressed version of it. And I haven't actually watched the program, but I would say... Do P90 first, and then when you've gotten to where, like, you've mastered that program and you're ready for more, then do P90X. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I think he has another um, P90, which you mentioned, and he also has 10-minute trainer. And these were pers- yeah. these were uh, the programs, I think, building up to P90X before he came out with P90X. And a lot of people don't even know that these programs exist because they're only seeing the thing that's the it thing now, so they don't know you know, the other things right. that, that he has out there. And, I mean, I stopped that insanity. I'm like, they have the asylum, and then they have something. I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, But if, if there are people out there who did insanity and they want to progress on, I know that they have some other programs out there. But, again, I just don't think that there's a need, you know, need for that. So, But while we're on these uh, exercise programs, these home exercise programs, let's just talk about, these extreme weight loss programs, the things that you see, the biggest loser, extreme, extreme, I think it's extreme weight loss makeover or something like that. It yeah. seems to me that you had a pet peeve about that when I read the book because it came off the page. Can you can can you kind of describe or can you kind of 
just talk about your pet peeve with those type of uh, exercise programs or exercise shows, rather? Well, you got to understand that these shows are edited. Anything on TV, and that includes the way infomercials are marketed, marketing in general. In fact, if you want to get technical, the world is manipulated. <laughs> but that's a whole other I, exactly, I know, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is primetime television. So when they show somebody who's 400 pounds running in the sand, you got to understand there's like teams of medical professionals on staff right there ready to handle any emergency at any moment. And they're trying to fit, let's just take the weight loss edition, they're trying to take a year's worth of physical activity and throw it into supposedly two hours, but it's got commercials, so it's really like an hour and a half of footage. So they actually may be progressing some of these people properly, but you're not going to see it. On top of it, even if there are some really high-intensity programs, and these shows are designed for ratings. I wish I could say that they're meant for the general well-being of the public, but let's face it, they're for ratings. So when you've got like ABC or NBC television and they're armed with like teams of attorneys, so if anything goes wrong, they're covered and they've got teams of medical professionals and all of these things are edited. So you might not even see the progression. In fact, just yesterday I was reading an article and they were talking about, I don't remember where I came across it, I, I I saved it. But they were talking about the fact that, yeah, they actually do progress some of these some of these contestants, and they don't necessarily have them hit the ground running. They might have them walk them, you know, uh, uh, on the treadmill at 2.6 miles an hour for like a minute on and a minute off, but we don't see that. So we're seeing, okay, you know, these guys are working eight hours a day, and they're under these incredibly strict nutritional guidelines but they're constantly being monitored. And again, when you see someone go through this type of metamorphosis, it is inspiring and it is fantastic and it is something, oh, yeah, you know, you're rooting for them and and you really want to do this for yourself, but for you to try to implement that stuff in your home by yourself, you're asking for trouble. Exactly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a call. We have somebody waiting on on the line here to ask a question, so I'm going to go ahead and take that call, Dana. Yes. Yeah. Caller from the 803, what's your name and where are you calling from? Don't make it done. Caller from the 803, what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello, you there? Okay, we'll come back to them. Sounds like somebody's getting out of the car or something like that. So we'll come back. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we talked about the extreme weight loss shows, um, and I kind of skipped over this, and I want to go back to it. Let's talk about, uh, and I was hoping that you would touch on this, and when you talked about the fitness facility, because I, I looked for this when I went to my fitness facility, and it was um, the AD. Can you talk about the importance of having an AD uh, on site? especially when you're exercising? Yes. The AED, the defibrillator, is meant to establish a heartbeat when there isn't one, and CPR was not enough to establish one. So the longer that the brain goes without oxygen, the higher the likelihood that brain damage will occur. And, in fact, um, you know, during the graduation, they show – they showed this news clip about a man who had gone down at a fitness facility and they they either didn't have the defibrillator or they treated him with the Heimlich maneuver instead or it was something to that effect. And, you know, he's a vegetable. <laughs> he's a vegetable for the rest of his life. And it was really just because right. he was trying to get into shape. So you want to make sure that they do have one of those around. It's that little defibrillator, and it'll actually say AED. You'll find them. You should find them in a lot of gyms. You'll definitely find them in hospitals. You, I have one in the condo in, in the lobby of my condo building. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, I've actually seen them in Publix. I've, I, I was amazing to me that I saw one in Publix. I was in Publix the other day, and they had one right behind the customer service counter. Publix is a local grocery store for those who are not in Florida, but <laughs> but they have <laughs> one behind the customer service counter. I'm like, wow, people are starting to get you know starting to get hip. Starting to get hit. Yeah. Yeah. So 
while we're on that and we're talking about the heart, you mentioned the importance of uh, doing blood pressure. <clears throat> Let's talk yeah. about what is a normal blood pressure range, because I don't think people out there know what a normal blood pressure range is. And the second part of that question is why, <clears throat> and I took this from the book as well, why is high blood pressure considered the the silent killer? So you can kind of tackle that. Well, there are no symptoms. So you can walk around with high blood pressure and not have any clue. And a normal blood pressure would be 120 over 80 or below. Actually, 120 over 80 is considered like the cutoff for normal. And then from there to 130 over 85, you're in like a pre-hypertensive condition and then 140 over 90 it's like stage one hypertension and then you start going above and if your blood pressure happens to be according to the acsm i'm just going off the top of my head i think it was 220 over 110 Ooh. you are just <laughs> exercise is like totally contraindicated so. yeah i um uh, the first time I started to do my uh, to do my boot camp, I had a woman come in, and she was, I think she was in her forties, and I took her blood pressure, and she was stage two hypertensive, and I said, I said, well, what are you, you know, what have you gone to the doctor? She's like, no, and I'm like, why? <laughs> but she didn't see anything wrong with that, that she was stage two hypertensive, and uh, I I just had a very hard time convincing her to get to the doctor because anything can happen when your blood pressure is that high. And I think a lot of people, and I don't think that she had anyone ever take her blood pressure. She mentioned to me that she hadn't gone to the doctor in a while, but I thought that that was just very, very serious. And I found that amazing that she could walk around with that high, you know, that type of hypertension and not really, um, you know, find out about it. And I could I could have seen that happen to her, you know, that she could have exercised and, 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 and died, you know? Yeah. Actually, it's 120 over 80. 120 to 139 to 80 to 89 is prehypertension. And then stage 1 hypertension, 140 to 159, 90 to 99, 160 and above, 100 and above is stage 2 hypertension. And 220 yeah. over 110 is your cutoff. I think... The woman that I, when I took her blood pressure, I think she was 160 was what yeah. she was. All right. I think yeah. I'm going to go back to a question. I think they came back. So let's see if we can take a question here. Um, Caller from 803, what's your name and where are you calling yeah. from? I want to think about that decision. Caller, are you there? Um, All right. So they're not there. <laughs> we'll continue on. I don't know what's going on now. So we got about twelve minutes, uh, you know, left in the show. In the show, um, I wanted to tackle two uh, something that's. Uh, this is something that I need to be more aware of, and sometimes I, I forget myself. Is about warming up and cooling down. What's why should we warm up and why should we we cool down, Dana? Warming up basically prepares your body for the stress of exercise. You wouldn't get into your car when it's 30 degrees out and just start the engine and go. And you shouldn't do it to your body. You need to prepare yourself. You need to warm your heart up. You need to warm your muscles up. You're going to be doing a lot of movement. You want to make sure the best form of stretching, especially before exercise, is like a dynamic stretch that's a movement-based stretch, something preferably kind of mimicking the exercises you're about to do, just a more regressed version of it. And it's just a way to, to, you know, the body communicates with itself. Our nervous system, our communications throughout the entire body. So when you start to communicate with those systems, this is what I intend to have you do, it can get ready for it. So that's a great way to help prevent a possible injury. And then cooling down is more than just, you know, that nice relaxing thing that you do afterwards. Sitting in Dr. Abbott's class, he started talking about blood pooling. And I actually mm -hmm. had shared a couple examples in the book where when you've been doing like high intensity exercises, and it really, I mean, it, it does happen a little bit more, I'd say, with older people, but younger people, it could happen as well. 
when you don't, when you are in the middle of a high intensity exercise and your heartbeat's really, really going and you just stop, something called blood pooling can happen. It's when all the blood starts to pool to the lower extremities of the body because there's no more movement to bring it back up to the heart. So you basically start to starve your heart of the blood and you can pass out and you can die. Yep, that's, Believe it or that's not, a, people have. Yeah, yeah. That's a good tip. The next tip is holding our breath when 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 lifting. Should we? Should I? Should I hold my breath when I'm lifting uh, weights or doing strength training? No. Now there is something called the Val, the Valsalva maneuver, and that is when you're doing a particularly heavy lift. But that would be more for uh, specific athletic training or maybe like Olympic-type training. You really need to be under very special guidance. But for the rest of the population, no, you don't want to hold your breath. General rule of thumb is you want to exhale on the exertion. So if you're doing, say, like a bench press, as you're pushing the weight above you, you would exhale. You'd inhale as you're allowing the weight to come back down. And I'm bad about that. I know when I temp, when I lift heavy weights, like if I'm on the bench press and I get into you know heavy weights, I have this very bad habit of holding my breath. And I'm just trying to be more conscious of that right now and, and, and remember to breathe. But I know that I've, I've had that habit for a long time. When it, the weight starts to get really heavy, then I want to hold my breath. Very bad habit. I need to pay attention to that. A lot of people do. A lot of people do, but you're you want to move, you're moving oxygen, so you definitely don't want to stop the flow of that. Yeah, and what are some other some other gym tips? Um, you know, we we mentioned not holding your breath and and other things. What are some other gym tips that people can can take? Is just action items if they were going to the gym tomorrow. What are some other things you would advise? Definitely bring water with you. Definitely, as we had said, warm up and cool down. If uh, work at your pace, in other words, and you want to follow, like, like, let's just say you don't know how to use a machine, get somebody to come and help you. There are ways in which the machine can be set up that are aligned with the axis of rotation point. So, in other words, let's just say you're doing a knee extension exercise, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend if you have terrible knees, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but especially if you're using heavy weights. But the axis of rotation point is where you see you see where the actual like the screw kind of allows the weight to come up and down, not the weight, but the bar to come up and down. You would want say like your knee to line up with that. So with whatever joint you're working, you would want it to line up with the access point of the machine. So if you're gonna go use a machine, you know, make sure that it's set up properly for your particular body size, you know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, if you're going to a well-established gym, then it's a likelihood that they're probably keeping the machines in good conditions. But you never know. You know, maybe take a look at some of the bands and make sure that they're not fraying if you're going to use them. Uh, make sure that they're in good condition. And don't copy other people. <laughs> I was going to get into that. Yeah, I've seen so many people in my gym that copy other people, and I'm like, wrong wrong, wrong, <laughs> and I want to go up and say something to them, and I, I, I've done that in the past, and I realize that some people get offended, so I've learned to kind of just turn the blind eye and just don't don't say anything, but can you talk about that, just copying other people? Yeah, well, you don't know where anybody else got their methods of training from. I mean, they could have learned it from somebody who didn't know what they were doing, and they were like, oh, that looks good. You know, you could watch somebody do a squat, and they can be doing it totally wrong, and you're going to emulate them mm-hmm. and hurt yourself. Or those behind-the-neck uh, lap pull-downs, which I see people doing all the time. I didn't know any better. I used to do it, too. But when you learn, so, yeah. yeah. What were you saying? I said I saw it this morning. I was in the gym this morning, early this morning, and I saw it behind-the-neck press. Exactly. Yeah, and the and the reason is because – and not only are you not getting the actual benefits of the exercise, but you're actually putting your, your shoulder joint in a stressed-out position from the beginning of the exercise. So not only are you getting the full benefit of it, but you're stressing out your very delicate shoulder joint by doing something like that. And listen to your body. This is a really, really, really big one. Listen to your body. 
because Mm -hmm. there's this whole little message out there about no pain, no gain. And, yeah, you know, the right kind of pain feels like I've worked, I kind of kicked my butt here, but I'm perfectly capable of moving around. I can move in any which direction. You know, nothing feels like it's torn or strained or sprained or anything like that. You know, in the middle of the exercise, maybe you feel a burn. Maybe you feel like you can't lift anymore. The bad kind of pain makes you feel like, I can't do this. I have to stop. It might feel like a cramp is going to start. I would never advise anybody to work through a cramp. You just stop. If something doesn't feel right, stop. If something exactly. feels heavy, yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah. Listen to yeah. your body. Yeah, so exercise shouldn't hurt I would you. definitely say. No, exercise is not supposed to hurt you. No, no. I got one last question because we're coming up on the end here. Um, And this is something that really, it it might be a pet peeve of me. It may may just be bothering me. But recently I I remember just scrolling through Facebook, and I saw someone made a comment that there was a pregnant woman uh, doing CrossFit. And CrossFit to me if so, if you if you do CrossFit, that's fine. I don't have any you know qualms about that. But I just thought that CrossFit for a pregnant woman, and you talk about this in your book, exercise when you're pregnant. For someone who's pregnant, I just thought that CrossFit was too. It was such a, a rigorous workout. I would never advise a woman to go in and, and, and do and do CrossFit. And I'm just wondering what are your um, your feelings uh, regarding that. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend that type of high-intensity exercise during pregnancy, not even in the first trimester. But if if in doubt, go talk to your gynecologist and and follow what they say. And if you're working with a trainer, I worked with somebody who was pregnant, and I got in touch with her doctor and made sure that I had any specific instructions. So I, I, I wouldn't personally recommend it. I would have to say, is your level of intensity so important that you're willing to stress out your baby? I mean, exercise is great, but during that time, I would recommend keeping it at a more moderate intensity type of type of thing. There's always time afterward. So. Yeah, people don't people don't know that that puts a lot of stress on your body, and yeah, we have so many stressed out women having stressed out babies right now. It's just not, not a good thing. Um, and I have one yeah. last question for you that someone asked through Facebook, and I'm going to let you answer this. I probably could have answered it, but I was like, I'll let Dana answer it. Someone asked the, the the fact of bending down, just the motion of bending down. They heard that it was bending down to touch the toes, uh, and it was bad for the lower back. What's your What's your thoughts on that? Well, if you're like like they used to do in PE class when they had you, like, bend down to touch your toes kind of thing. I mean, if you do that motion and you're actually straining your back to do it, it's not a good idea. And you're exposing you're exposing all the discs in, the, in between the vertebrae of your spine as well. I don't believe in forcing movement. I just, I just don't. So if you happen to be ridiculously limber, and there are some people that are, and it is absolutely effortless for you to go down – and touch the ground, and you can do this all day, every day. Then fine, but if not, I, I don't. I, I wouldn't force it. And this is, and I, I just want to. I just want to throw this in here. There's a lot of information and a lot of misinformation out there, and everybody is looking outside of themselves for the answers. The answer is always in you. The answer is always listen to your body. The answer is always go with the flow. The answer is always. Choose the exercise you want to do. Choose what makes you happy. Go with your bliss and and, and enthusiasm. And challenge yourself, yes, definitely. But stop believing everything that the media is telling you, especially if it doesn't ring true to you. Because this is what I was saying about the manipulation. It's all of these ideas are based on what's most marketable at that time. And science is always changing. So Exactly. Yeah. Very well said. Dano, what's the name of your book again? It's a simple guide to exercise safety. What you don't know can hurt you. And I also have a blog and it's called I choose awareness dot com. 
and I discuss exercise and a whole host of other topics on that blog. And you also, I think I, you were working on something else. Are you working on another book? I am working on another book. It actually wasn't going to, it wasn't going to be about exercise. It was going to be about awareness. And awareness has everything to do with how you exercise and how you take care of yourself. It's a mindfulness. In this book, you're, I, I'm giving you, I'm giving you simple, simple safety tips. But the general principle of this book is conscious awareness. Be present. Be present with how you feel, how you think, how you react to life, how you react to yourself, what decisions got you to this place to where you feel like you have to take this weight off. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna make a difference if you rush to take the weight off. If you're gonna go and behave in the exact same way, it's gonna put it back on to begin with. So, yep. Yep. the body follows the mind. Yes, I believe that. Yep. All right, so we have all of your information. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Dana, and I uh, hope to have you back when you have your your next book. I thank you so much, Darren. It was a pleasure. I thank you for asking me. Okay. Thank you. All right. And if anybody on the page has any questions, they can feel free to post them, and I'll answer them after the show. Okay. All right. Okay. You hear that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Take care. All right. Take care, Dana. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. So the show is a wrap. Um Thursday show, I'm doing a special show Thursday. On that show, you'll have a chance to <clears throat> talk with uh, Dr. Scott Becker. Dr. Scott Becker is a pediatric physician who turned a functional medicine specialist, and he'll be talking about thyroid and adrenals. Do not miss that show. You'll have Dr. Becker is very generous with his time, and I'm sure he'll uh, ask, uh, be able to answer a lot of questions that you might have regarding your thyroid and adrenals. And then on Tuesday of next week, which I'll probably announce this again Thursday. There's a personal favorite of mine, a book that's coming out, uh, not coming out, a book that is, was already written um, by Raymond Francis, and the, and the name of the book is Never Be Sick Again. It's one of those books I think everybody should have and read. I didn't read it when I started my journey, but I wish that I'd had it when I started my, my personal uh, health care journey. But you don't want to miss that show. Um, Dr. Francis, the MIT a trained scientist, and he went through his own health battles and wrote a book about the you know things that you need to know in order to be healthy. So I hope that you'll join me for those shows. Thank you for listening in, and I'll and have a good night, and I'll see you on the next show. Thanks. Bye bye.